It is not common that a film or any work of art might acknowledge all of its predecessors going back thousands of years, celebrating a tradition, and yet also be expressively modern, radical, and forward-thinking. Nikos Nikolaidis is among the great directors in the history of Greek cinema, and in every Dicky BA 2037, the director dives into the artistic depth of Greece's past while is filming through a 20th century lens. This film is a retelling of the Greek myth Orpheus and Eurydice. This myth entails Orpheus seeking his deceased wife Eurydice in the underworld Hades. Orpheus, ever the gifted musician, persuades Hades himself with his lyre. Hades allows Eurydice, sorry, Orpheus to take Eurydice with him, but under one condition. She will have to follow him while walking out of, from the caves of the underworld, but he must not look at her before coming out or else he might lose her forever. Thinking it a simple task, Orpheus thanks Hades and leaves. However, on the road back to the light, he is unable to hear Eurydice's footsteps. He suspects that either she must be a shade, a spirit, to be reformed as human in the light, or that the gods have fooled him. Not far from the exit, Orpheus loses his faith and turns to see Eurydice behind him, only for her, shade to be whisked away back among the dead, trapped within Hades forever. It is a tale known most relayed from texts by Plato, from Virgil, and from Ovid. This film, however, does not focus on Orpheus, but rather on Eurydice. I shall read out this film's synopsis, courtesy of Nikos Nikolaitis himself, as provided by his official website. It reads, Eurydice lives imprisoned inside a metaphorical hellhouse in a country ruled by a dictatorship regime. Having already served her time, she's waiting to be transferred somewhere else. However, the state processor in charge of the prisoner's transfers has been mocking her for days, maybe even years. A long-lost lover, Orpheus, contacts her asking to see her again. Eurydice accepts, hoping that something will change, yet she is also afraid of any changes. Orpheus arrives, not as a saviour, but as the new face of death. Eurydice will kill him and will remain in her personal hell forever. Nice, nice. That essentially sums it up narratively. I also felt like sharing some here some text I found on the same webpage. Director Nicolaitis has supplied some of his own comments about this film. The film was completed in 1975, but it took six years for Greek cinemas to present it. Meanwhile, this was only days after a major earthquake. Consequently, I realised that the audience this film appealed to was a reckless one, made up of people who willingly huddled into the basement of the movie theatre Alkionida. Alkionida. Driven cinephiles, which ignored the published critics, disregarding both good and bad reviews because we all know how the critics system works by now. Well, there are very few things one could say to a reckless audience, so I decided to copy a short note that I had written for the 1975 Thessaloniki Film Festival. There is a certain risk involved when the director writes a short introduction in his effort to introduce the film's meaning to an audience that hasn't seen it yet. Some of the problems which arise because of short introductions are, one, the director tries to point out the completely non-existent elements which he would have liked to include in his film but wasn't able to, two, the director limits the audience's participation, thus he imposes on the method of communication, three, the director predetermines the film's functions, thus works against the independence of his own creation. So the only purpose of a short introduction is to stimulate, nothing more. Certain intellectual Italian critics asserted that Eurydice BA 2037 applies and finally proves Leotard's cinemat cinematographic theories as well as the solution to many of the problems which puzzled Pasolini's for years. I am embarrassed because I didn't know then and I still don't know anything about Leotard's theories or Pasolini's problems. And that is the writing of Nikos Nikolaitis. I love it. So, on to my comments about this film. This is an enormous favourite of mine. I at one time claimed this was amongst my f top 5 favourite films, or perhaps even my favourite film overall. It still remains among my most beloved films of all time, to be sure. There are a multitude of reasons why, and I would like now to list them here. This is a phenomenal piece of film direction. Star Vera Sechawa is an extraordinary embodiment of tortured will, and she is photographed so particularly amongst her space. The angles of this film are candid, unromantic, and absolutely deliberated. The act of trapping Eurydice through the filmic frame is so considered. The blocking, further sharing the mood of obstruction, is absolutely masterly. Her framing is often unstable, unusual. She is dynamic and alive, yet in a kind of psychological stasis. Nikolaitis' camera captures her rapid, unpredictable thought processes.
Meanwhile, the actual photography is superb. Glorious black and white nakedness, employing sparse yet pronounced light for polished clarity of Eurydice's psychological prison, her gaze. I refer to both her surrounding sights and her masking face. Contrastingly, the dark conjures silhouettes, framing the human outline, but lacking individual detail, reducing Eurydice to an impression against environment, as the coldest of psychological discourse could claim. The set design is quite fascinating. I enjoy the basic outfits of Eurydice, particularly her posh fur coat. As for the room decor, I certainly enjoy all of the newspapers that have been stuck against the walls of this interior, an apt visual demonstration of typical 20th century madness. The music choices are exemplary, beautifully enunciating their photographic companion. The, condition, the compositions utilized include Lute and Mandolin Concerti, La Notte, written by Antonio Vivaldi, Andante Spianato and Grande Polonaise, written by Frederick Chopin, and Till, performed by Dina Shaw. The sound design is transfixing. We hear echoes of aircraft, distant gunfire, and crackling radio broadcasts, truly a 20th century police state nightmare. We are also subject to the strange sounds of seagulls, these manic shaking bells, and the occasional omnipresence of electric fizzes, clicks, and bounces, the kind of thing one might hear on a Karl Heinz Stockhausen recording I might proximately compare. To be honest, the thought occurred to me that this film might possibly be considered the prototype to the kind of sound design pioneered in Lynch's Eraserhead two years later. Though Lynch could never have seen this film, because as Nicolaitis apparently suggests, this film was completed in 75 and shown at at least one film festival, but was not screened until 1981 in cinemas generally. But hey, maybe Lynch was at the 1975 Thessaloniki Film Festival, you never know. Actually, a part of me considered this film a bridge between the existentialism of Bergman and the surrealism of Lynch, although I feel as though Nicolaitis operates in a much more particular, though paradoxically something much larger than also than where Bergman and Lynch seem to occupy. Bergman crafted a paramount for cinematic equivalence to existential literature, whereas Lynch frames the screen as dream, indebted to surrealism and the unconscious manifests of Bergman both. I recall cinema's relationship to the fundamental theories of human psychology. Both the radical modernist vanguard and the Western philosophical tradition were bound to address the inexorable presence of psychoanalytic thought. Psychoanalytic thought had a particular relationship with ancient Greek myths, utilizing their wisdom to illustrate effective analogies for their all-encompassing theories on human individual conduct. It is in this that Nicolaitis, with this particular piece, more assertively occupies a space more ancient and innate than the psychoanalysis that compelled acknowledgement from all 20th century philosophies. While it's firmly engaging in both impulsive lawless surrealism and telepathic filmic existentialism, every dicky BA2037 reaches back beyond Freud and toward the mythos of ancient Greek civilizations, superseding the limits of the century, and so then perhaps even more so encapsulating it than even Bergman's persona or Lynch's Eraserhead. That may or may not be a coherent series of speculations. And some of the editing here is spellbinding. One fantastically imaginative sequence features Eurydice on the telephone. The scene is edited, edited unconventionally. We frequently cut to spaces just bereft of Eurydice and then panning over her face, or cutting to space just above her, she will stand up, immediately re-entering the scene. Her mind wanders, frequenting in and out of the space, though our gaze seizing her every frame. They serve to communicate an immense psychological pulse. This particular sequence is one of the most creative depictions of psychosomatic cycles ever realized, a fantastic microcosm of this entire film's overall affect. Also perhaps of note is the wonderfully strange reverse vomit sequence. Keep an eye out for that memorable instance. One of the penultimate sequences in this film is its most evocative piece of editing, however. In what appears to be analogous to Orpheus' fateful straight trek out of the underworld, a whirlwind of passionately emotive slices. A violent dance where physical love and violence appear to intensely copulate. Its weight upon a viewer can be overwhelming. Eurydice, a prisoner of stagnation, a personification of seemingly anhedonic or protective indifference, unleashes the repressed this repressed storm of passion. There are no words capable, or necessary, to describe the pure urge. But then there is the climatic, climactic long take which closes this film. Well, what can I say? The camera pans away from Eurydice discussing her transfer over the phone, again. And here at last we are gifted to a true articulation of this house's geometry, previously obscured through regular editing. We pan past what appears to be several other figures of Eurydice in this house. One stands in the kitchen, one peeks out from behind a door holding a kitchen knife, another visible behind a shower curtain. I am unsure as to how the sequence was enacted. It may not be a true long take, some very clever trickery may have been employed, there may very well be a cut within this immaculate sequence, 
but it does not take away from what may be the most impressive final shot or sequence of any film I have ever seen. And so engaging in surrealism, taking place in some amalgamated Eastern Bloc authoritarian state and sprinkled with Stockhausen-esque sonic stimulation, this picture is wholly magnificent. Occupying an interior space, pondering and processing visions of the outside world. This film is my life. I may be living in the 21st century rather than the 20th, but as Mark Fisher, rest in peace, compellingly suggested, to be in the 21st century is to have 20th century culture on high definition screens. Yes, and I almost wish I didn't love it so damned much at times.